Howdy folks, Kurt Ulrich here for my Unit 3 uh, lab using a kit. I decided to go with cheese. Um, cheese is one of my most favorite foods and um, the kitchen is one of my most favorite places. So if I'm going to be trapped at home doing labs, I might as well be doing something that I can eat, right? And plus cooking. It's chemistry. Well, the Unit 3 lab was supposed to be a lab kit. This is kind of a lab kit, though it doesn't come in a white box necessarily. Uh, I guess lab kitchen. Uh, I'm a fan of kitchens, like I said. Cheese, yeah, and podcasts. Uh, Science Friday is a great podcast. It's got all kinds of nerdy stuff on there that I like. Uh, it's put out by WNYC. It's on NPR, so it's well-researched and reputable and all that good stuff. Uh, and on their webpage, they have uh, a lab. It's uh, set up for educators. Uh, they have, it's, like I said, essentially a lab that goes through step by step. It has supporting questions and supporting uh, videos and all kinds of good stuff. So uh, it's it seemed like a plug and play. I'll get to that later on. So I gathered up all the materials that I needed. Um, there are a couple that are a little bit weird that you might not have in your house. Um, citric acid. Uh, used in canning and uh, stuff like that. So all the, all the shelves were wiped out of it uh, at the stores that I went to. A uh, little tough given the coronavirus issues that we're dealing with now, finding a place that, that carried it. Uh, but I did find a beer and wine supply shop because it's used in making wine uh, that had some and they were open. Hmm. Uh, and so I got some there. The other thing is uh, rennet. Uh, rennet traditionally comes from the lining of calves' stomachs. It's the enzyme that's involved in coagulating uh, milk proteins. So uh, you can get animal rennet. It is available. Um, some people get a little oobed out by using the scrapings of calves' stomachs. Uh, there is vegetable rennet. It's what I use. Of course, vegetable rennet is genetically modified. Uh, so you got that. It's not made by vegetables. It's made by bacteria. Uh, the other thing that, uh, that this lab requires uh, is a good thermometer like a digital candy thermometer. The lab itself is broken up into two basic parts. We got the first part, which deals with the curds themselves. So um, it's like a comparative experiment. Uh, I use four different um, uh, fat contents of milk. You can get your hands, I guess, on different types of milk, uh, different animals or whatever, then you can use that. Um, but I just used skim, 1%, 2%, and whole milk, 3 and whatnot. Um, and uh, I did this with my son, Bruce. Uh, I figured if my 10-year-old uh, could do it, then my 10th grader should be able to do it. Uh, I, I mean, I have, I've done basically this lab, this part of the lab before, where uh, we've taken milk and added lemon juice to it and, you know, see the changes in the protein. But this is, there's a little bit more to this one. Uh, so you heat up the milk first and uh, add some lemon juice, stir it up, uh, just 90, 95 degrees. So just so you start to see some steam. Uh, and then strain that, uh, and then you have to wait and wait. There's a lot of waiting in this lab. Again, we'll get to that a little bit later. After the curds have been separated from the whey, uh, you can do a little comparison. Here you can see the skim milk uh, curds are a lot crumblier than the whole milk curds down at the bottom there, um, which are a lot creamier, which definitely makes sense. A good little data table to collect the information, uh, some quantitative as well as some qualitative data. Um, and so this is a good place to talk about, hey, what is the difference between damp, slightly damp, and wet, and slightly wet uh, He's dead. Part two, we actually make cheese. Curds in part one, not the most delicious. Couldn't get my 10-year-old to eat any of them. I can't really blame them. The skim milk ones in particular were super dry and crumbly. So uh, we've got to gather the stuff together to make the cheese. See, I got uh, tongs. Didn't end up using the tongs. The tongs would help you pick up the uh, cheese curds out of the hot water. Uh, I just went right with um, gloves. You can see I got heavy-duty gloves there. Got to use heavy-duty gloves because uh, if you're using the water method, the water is 175, 185 degrees. So uh, scalding. If you use the uh, microwave, uh, even then the cheese is coming out at 135, 140 degrees, um, and you're going to burn yourself. Um, I also have a, a spatter shield there. Uh, I didn't end up using the spatter shield so much. Um, 
uh, I used a strainer instead, and you can just use a colander that has a uh, cheesecloth layered down there in the bottom. Uh, this is the step where we use the citric acid and uh, the rennet tablets rather than just the uh, lemon juice like we did in the first part. Um, you let that sit for a while. We heat it up. We heat up the milk, add the citric acid, uh, add the rennet. Um, and then let it sit for a while uh, and you'll get a separation of the curds and uh, the way the curds start to kind of clump together. Uh, you take a knife and cut them. Uh, it's good to heat them up a little bit. All right, so cook them a little bit at not boiled, like 108, uh, 110 degrees, something like that. Uh, and you let them kind of set for a while. And then you can just use a slotted spoon and scoop them out of the whey. Uh, save the whey. You can make ricotta cheese out of the way later on. Um, that's a whole other lab because then you got to let the the whey sit around overnight and let it get sour, and that drops the pH. It's by itself through the action of bacteria. Super cool. Anyway, um, so you uh, uh, separate the curds from the whey in the strainer. Let those separate. Uh, and then you have to melt the curds together. There's a couple different ways you can do it. You can do it um, the way that they describe in the Science Friday podcast, which is using hot water. Uh, that's the Italian method uh, where you get almost boiling water and you put the curds in almost boiling water and you kind of let the curds melt in the boiling water and then you got to kind of gather them together and squeeze them and let them melt and get them all elastic and all that fun stuff. Uh, or you can just just put it in the microwave for 45 seconds uh, and stir it up. Make sure it's at 135, 140 degrees. Uh, and uh, if it's not, put it in again uh, for another 20 seconds and take it out and then just knead away. And uh, eventually what you'll get is uh, as the elastic nature of the protein starts to build, uh, you'll get the really stretchy, stringy cheese. Um, one of the things that the uh, lab goes on and, and has students try out is uh, uh, different, again, different uh, milk fat contents. Uh, and then using this elastic test as one of the criteria, one of the things to compare. Uh, you know, the uh, the longer the string, the uh, better the cheese, I guess. I don't know. You see, I got pretty good, uh, pretty good string on mine. Well, now that I'm done with the lab, how did it go? I got to say, I thought it went really, really well. I mean, I got a lab that I can do with my students, right? Um, and I have cheese, and I love cheese. Um, now, the first part was pretty uh, straightforward. Didn't have any trouble. Biggest problem was uh, as you filter, strain the uh, cheese curds from the whey, uh, the cheese curds would get like embedded into the uh, into the cheesecloth, uh, and so it was hard to get a good yield. Easy fix, though. All we did was just get the mass of the cheesecloth before we did the straining. Uh, and it wasn't an issue. Now, when it came to making the uh, mozzarella, we ended up with a little bit more of, uh, of a problem. Um, the Science Friday website uh, uses the traditional Italian water method. Uh, where you heat up the water and take your curds and put them in the um, 175 degree water. And as soon as my curds hit that water, before they would have a chance to melt and start to kind of coagulate together um, and start to hook up those proteins, they just separated. Uh, and I uh, ended up with little lumps and, uh, and no good cheese. It never actually came together as cheese. Uh, and so where do we go when we're having trouble? We need some solutions to a problem, how to do something. YouTube. And uh, I also, for something new and exciting, I read the instructions uh, that came with the Reddit tablets. Uh, and both of those places, lots of YouTube videos and uh, the Reddit tablet instructions, uh, made reference to using a microwave rather than the hot water. Uh, take the curds, put them in a little mixing cup and just stick them in a Pyrex mixing cup and stick them in the microwave uh, for 45 seconds. Uh, they come out, test it with the candy thermometer, make sure it's 135, 140 degrees. If it is, you can get the little kneading going on, right? Do the pulling, get the stretching, get those uh, 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 proteins to hook up with one another, make the elastic uh, uh, fibers and away you go. And that got me thinking if my students are going to do this, if I'm going to give this to my students to do, then they have to have access to a microwave. 
They have to have access to a candy thermometer. Heck, they have to have access to uh, uh, the uh, the cheesecloth itself. Um, so there are some other equipment that I have to make sure that my students have. Every good lab is going to have allowances for students to make errors and go back and try it again. And this is one of those labs. As long as you have the raw materials, um, you can go back and do it again. Uh, and the materials are not hard to come by, even the citrate. Um, it's only required in very small amounts, so a little bit goes a long ways. Uh, the big stumble bunny to doing this over and over again is the time that's involved. Now, the uh, Science Friday website said it takes between one to two hours. Uh, the Science Friday website skips a pretty big step. Right after you add the citrate and the renin to the uh, milk to make the mozzarella, you're supposed to let it sit for one to two hours. Now the uh, instructions for Science Friday only say to wait five minutes. Uh, and when I only waited the five minutes, I had all kinds of problems. When I waited the one to two hours, it was much, much easier to do. Um, so time-wise, this is a three-hour lab. The important thing uh, to keep in mind is that two hours of that is wait time. And the other cool thing about that two hours uh, is that it doesn't have to be two hours, right? It, you, it, can, it can be 45 minutes probably uh, and would still most likely work. Uh, and you can let it go a long time. Uh, uh, more than two hours and uh, you'll still get a good yield. How does this compare to the actual industrial process? Uh, remarkably similar. Um, when you're done, you end up with a uh, delicious product that um, goes really well on pizza. The webpage from Science Friday that describes this whole lab is riddled with questions throughout the whole thing. There's good uh, pre-lab questions and lab, uh, questions during the procedure uh, and some conclusion questions as well. The format's not the best for a write-up for my region students perhaps. Uh, uh, for them I'm sure I would uh, load those questions into a Google Forms or something like that that's a little bit more give them a little bit more structure when it comes to answering the questions uh, at the end of course they have the standard um, do something different in the procedure and see how that changes the outcome right make a little experiment out of it um, which uh, when it comes to stuff like this I, I feel like these are the types of uh, um, going beyond experiments uh, that students will actually be a little bit more motivated to do. Um, as far as actually uh, how would I implement this lab in class, I feel like uh, I, I really would need to have a direct contact with my students. So this wouldn't be something to do uh, from a hundred percent distance perspective, distance delivery. Um, uh, you know, maybe this would be like a take-home lab for my students to do where I can give them all the equipment at school uh, and the materials and they can go, kind of go home and do it. Maybe they can do it in smaller groups. Um, and I can totally see where I could turn this into um, uh, a group, kind of different groups working with one another. Um, so I could have different groups doing different uh, uh, different milk fat com uh, uh, contents. Uh, and uh, videoing their uh, elastic test and then making that available to all the other students so they can compare their data that way. Um, uh, since it's food, right, we have an eating component here, so maybe we could um, have the students make something out of it and then film, make films of other people uh, eating their food, and then we can get some sort of... Uh, qualitative analysis out of it. I don't know, something like that. Um, the nice thing again is that there's a, there's a hook here um, to their food and now I'm starting to get students to look at their food as a more than just, mm -mm, that's good, put it in my face, and a little bit more of the chemical components, uh, those proteins hooking up, um, the micelles forming, milk fat, uh, all of that good stuff is all kind of wrapped up in this lab. As far as standards goes, uh, students will be developing their own methodologies. They'll be um, explaining why their hypotheses or conclusions make sense. Um, uh, there's 
plenty of good standard stuff loaded into this lab. I know this is on the late side. I hope some people watch this. I'm looking forward to uh, getting some feedback. Thanks.